What is tragedy? In Shakespeare, a comedy can be very serious, but it has a happy ending. A tragedy doesn't. In life, people travel through this journey and make of various things a tragedy. Some so great that the greatest tragedy then takes place to end it all and have a shortcut to what they hope is peace, they hope. But actually, on the map of eternity, relatively speaking, relatively speaking, there is only one tragedy. It's that of not making it beyond the veil. For in comparison with that, everything in time is in a minor key, awful though it may seem. But this is major and it won't stop. It can actually happen that a priest will have confessions of a person here or there who wants to go to confession before ending it all, indicating how little they have understood of their faith. This expression that we have in today's reading from the Epistle to the Hebrews has entered into our language. It talks about the one who has penetrated beyond the veil. In Welsh, it's there in our rich hymnology, Ti hunt ir sen, beyond the veil. Often sung at funerals. The veil, at that point, is not that dense. We are on the frontier of aeons. One more breath, and the eyes open, the eyes of the immortal soul. And in this week of prayer for the healing of the wounds in the mystical body, that is the bottom line, actually, complex though we may make it. The church, the life of Christians, is all about getting souls safely and soundly beyond the veil. The Church, in the dogmatic constitution of the Church itself, Lumen Gentium, is defined as the sacrament of the salvation of the human race. And that's what we're here for, glorifying God and getting as many of our brethren with us safely beyond the veil. Let us always remember that when involved in theological debate. It is actually something that the devil is aware of, so he'll try and make us unaware of it and get us entangled with things that actually don't help. It doesn't help to give souls distorted messages. The devil knows it, so he works through weak links. He's done so in the past, and though we have to be very polite, we must not forget that we don't have a right to relativise the truth. True ecumenical dialogue is not about whittling away the fullness of faith, so as to find some trunk that we share in common. A more correct approach would be this other one, which operates on the mystical level. Getting home safe and sound with any means of grace that actually the Holy Ghost may wish to use, because he is on side and he is glad when all over the Christian globe souls look for him sincerely and pray for him and worship in spirit and in truth 
And that bit we don't have a right to judge because actually we don't know whose interior life and whose prayer is pleasing. We may have a certain complacency because we have the sacramental system which work. But I remember being greatly impressed by the way that the rare celebrations of, okay, an invalid Holy Communion are celebrated in the Baptist sphere, rarely but intensely, with a prayer meeting to prepare on the preceding Sunday of the monthly celebration of the Lord's Supper. And also with friends who I had who were Presbyterians in the Scottish sphere, where it was only four times a year. And also with brethren who were in the Eastern Orthodox Church, who had only a weekly divine liturgy. It was an event. We forget that there is much truth in the old English saying, familiarity breeds contempt. And I must confess that the Protestant celebration that I had access to in my adolescence was actually certainly a means of grace and we entered into the Last Supper with intensity. There was no real presence but the Lord certainly was not absent either in his communication to the soul who wanted him, waited for him and remembered him in the eve of his passion. The Gospel talks about the neglect of the Sabbath. That perhaps on this day would be a point to take away with us, looking precisely over our shoulder. We can be complacent by what has become a minimalistic attitude. 